There are many films I could have chosen to represent the Navy during the Second World War. The Battle of the River Plate, or Noel Cowards in which we serve, for example, which should both be up there on your watch list. But for me, it's got to be the 1953 classic, The Cruel Sea. Attacking, stand by. Based on the best-selling book of the same name by Nicholas Montserrat. In my opinion, it is the film to watch if you're even remotely interested in naval warfare during the Second World War, fought in sub-zero temperatures in howling seas and where the enemy is just as much of a threat as the elements. It could be said I'm a little biased towards this film, as it's a firm family favourite. My father is without a doubt its number one fan, owning the film in every format possible and being able to quote entire scenes with incredible ease. Directed by Charles Friend, The Cruel Sea is a classic 50s British war movie, the officers are clipped and the lower ranks are working class. However, they are never shown to be anything more than men of their era, just trying to serve their country and make it home safely after the war has been won. The film's plot focuses on the crew of the Compass Rose, a flower-class corvette serving as a convoy escort during the Battle of the Atlantic. Opening during the ship's fitting on the Clyde, the crew first meet one another and undertake sea trials and training for anti-submarine warfare, using tools such as ASDIC, a form of sonar, used to detect U-boats underwater, and depth charges used to blast those U-boats to the bottom of the sea and further protect convoys vital to the war effort. Anti-submarine detector, ASDIC for short. A device under the ship here sends a series of sound impulses out through the water like this. Bing! Jack Hawkins, who plays the lead Lieutenant Commander George Erickson, wrote this about the film in his 1973 biography. The Cruel Sea contained no false heroics. This is why we all felt that we were making a genuine example of the way in which a group of men went to war. Along with Hawkins, there are plenty of other recognisable post-war stars aboard the Compass Rose. Donald Sindon portrays the newly appointed Sub-Lieutenant Keith Lockhart and a young Stanley Baker, who depicts the sneering Lieutenant James Bennett. I can guarantee it's worth watching for their performances alone. The film doesn't skimp on historical accuracy either, something that's plagued many post-war war movies. Need I mention that quote-unquote tiger tank in A Bridge Too Far? The ships used in the film are the real deal, the Compass Rose being portrayed by the flower course corvette the HMS Coriopsis, commissioned on the 17th of August 1940, and seeing action as a convoy escort until 1943, where she was transferred to the Royal Hellenic Navy of Greece, being renamed the Chrysis. They looked like military destroyers, and were in fact built in Admiralty yards. But more and more were needed, and civilian yards had to be used. So another class was designed, the flower class, the Sturtia, Primrose, Delphinium. This class can be turned out quickly and in large numbers. Built on the whale catcher lines, they can stand up to the worst Atlantic weather. Their job is to protect convoys. She continued her roles in escort, operating from Liverpool, and also helping to escort the convoy ECM-6 that was part of the Normandy landings in June 1944. She was finally decommissioned in 1952, ending up in Malta after the war, and was due to be scrapped but was acquired by Ealing Studios for use in the movie. I don't want to go into too much detail of the movie's plot, as I truly believe this film cannot be summed up by words alone but there is one sequence I want to delve into, however it is a key part of the film, and in my opinion a spoiler, so consider this fair warning. <coughs> Around the film's halfway point, the ship's commander, Ericsson, is faced with a dilemma, being forced to choose between using a depth charge to strike back at a U-boat that has been shadowing him, but in the process, killing men that are in the water just ahead of the compass rose. The entire sequence beautifully displays Ericsson's clear anguish and inner turmoil as he battles with the morality of his situation. Will he sacrifice the men in the water for the greater good, or let the U-boat evade him and live to fight another day? To the shock and horror of the crew, the charges are released, and what transpires after is for me possibly the greatest visual sequence in British cinema, using the perspective of the crew of the Compass Rose to show the fate of the men in the water. Instantaneous echo, sir. Fire one!
The Cruel Sea is a real testament to those naval servicemen who braved the swell of the oceans to keep Britain going throughout the war. The conditions they fought in were some of the worst of the conflict. We owe them a great debt and should never forget their contributions to the war effort, inarguably the most important theatre of the war, with Winston Churchill saying the only thing he truly feared was the U-boat menace. This is a story of the Battle of the Atlantic, the story of an ocean, two ships and a handful of men. The men are the heroes, the heroines are the ships, the only villain is the sea, the cruel sea.